Great. Hello, good morning. The YMC Education Series is free and open to the public, so we encourage you to spread the word and invite family and friends to participate. Uh, we host approximately eight to 10 of these a month, um, varying in different topics. This program will last about an hour and you might find you have questions during the presentation. Matt's always um, welcoming those questions and answers, but we can answer them at the end as well. When you have a questions, you can type it into the chat section on your screen and I can relay the question to Matt, our speaker. If you raise your hand and ask a question, um, if the chat button isn't working for you. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. And now I'd like to introduce you to Matt Margolis. He's going to be speaking to us about discussing important documents. Um, he will broach the conversation and all that goes with it. And Matt will also discuss just how important it is to let those you know what, what you want if and when the time comes. So welcome, Matt, and welcome, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everybody. I see uh, a familiar a couple familiar faces I think um, that's for sure I think actually those everybody that, that's showing me their screen I know I've seen you before um, and I know there's somebody on here who I know as well who's not showing their screen so um, so as Pam said my name is Matt Margolis uh, my partner Lauren Weldon and I have an estate planning elder law practice in downtown Park Ridge we assist people with um, all of their planning needs. Um, we do wills, trusts, powers of attorney, special needs planning, asset protection work. Uh, we help people, uh, people's families after somebody passes away. We handle probate, um, trust administration. Um, and then on the elder law side of our practice, we have a really strong focus on helping people apply for Medicaid, um, protect assets, look at benefits, uh, particular benefit through the VA that can help pay for long-term care. And in general, just sort of help be a, um, a resource for families that are that are dealing with a loved one who's going through a transition, whether it's bringing a caregiver into the home or moving into some sort of sort of long term care community. Um, you know, in those situations, there might be, you know, there might be three or four people that they need to to, to, to communicate with to help them. And we're just one piece of the puzzle. So we really like to do what we can to help put them in touch with all the other professionals. Um, and all the other resources that they that they can benefit from. You know, we really we really like to take a holistic approach. Um, all right. So today today will be a shorter talk. Um, you know, it, which uh, is nice every once in a while, right? Because so you don't need to hear me ramble on for an hour. Um, important documents, right? So today, even while they are important, we are not going to be talking about wills and trusts. Um, we've talked about the you know we talk about those a couple times a year uh, on some of these on some of these talks. We are not going to discuss that today. Today is really to talk about a few of those um, documents that, you know, for me, in my opinion, uh, at least the first couple I talk about, I think everybody over the age of 18 should have them. So we are going to start by talking about powers of attorney. Um, but actually, before I get there, let me preface this. You know, I think what's what can be difficult is um, for a lot of us is, is the idea of of even having a difficult, you know, having a difficult conversation with, with loved ones, um, you know, about what we, what we might want or what we might not want uh, in an end of life or, you know, close to end of life situation. Um, you know, I think while I, you know, in doing this for, geez, almost 11 years now or 12, I don't know, 11 or 12 years now, I can't remember, um, in practicing in this area, you know, I can tell you that the vast majority of people I meet with, have the, their preference is that they do not want their life artificially prolonged, okay? Their preference and the preference of, again, the majority, at least that I sit down with, so I have to imagine this is the majority, probably at least the majority in general, I don't, unless I just happen to find all the people that agree, sort of agree with each other. Um, but, you know, the majority of people have this idea that they don't want their lives artificially prolonged, right? And, you know, and I want you to keep me comfortable. I want you to do what you can to keep me alive. But if I'm gonna have no quality of life, I don't want my life, I don't want to just be strung along, right? That's sort of, these are just my words. Um, and some people do, some people do want that. And that's fine. You know, everybody, everybody's entitled to feel however they want to feel. Everybody's entitled to what they want at, at the end of their life. Um, and there's no right or wrong. And, and I'm never going to, I'm never going to make a client feel, um, feel bad about, about how they feel or, or judge them for how they feel. And none of us should, you know, that goes along with, 
you know, obviously I'm not going to judge a client. None of us should judge, you know, our, our, our husband or our wife or our children or our brothers or sisters, our moms, our dads, our aunts and uncles. I mean, however they feel is how they feel. Um, the, obviously the issue becomes, you know, if we're, if we're looking to name somebody to be making decisions for us at some point, you know, we really need to be sure that the people that we're naming will honor how we feel. You know, and it's probably something that we want to really keep uh, keep in mind. You know, when we're putting some of the documents in place that I'm going to talk about today, um, because it's it's great, right? I I can tell my wife that you know, listen, Christina, I do not want my life artificially prolonged. You know how I feel. Keep me comfortable. You know, I'm not saying just don't try, right? Um, but I don't want to just be laying up in a laying in a hospital bed for the rest of my life. I don't want to be just you know living. The only way for me to live is to be hooked up to machines. You know, to me, that's zero. That's a couple of things, right? To, in my in my head, that's zero quality of life for me. And then I, at the same time, I am just a burden on my family, as my family just sort of watches me waste away, um, not really being able to contribute in any meaningful way to life. Okay. Now again, those are my thoughts. I am not telling anybody else they should feel that way. But I'm saying this because, you know, these are the conversations that I think we need to have with our loved ones. It's not, it's not an uplifting conversation, depending on what side of the coin you're on, right? Um, even if you say, I want my life prolonged no matter what, I don't care how bad things are, I don't, you know, freeze me, you know, give me experimental pills, hook me up to machines. I don't, again, I don't care what side you're on. I think that the, at the end of the day, it's, it's not a comfortable conversation. This is not something that, it's also not something I suggest that you bring up, you know, uh, at Christmas dinner or at uh, your Seder. I mean, the, those are not the right times, but it's good for the people around us to know how we feel. We don't want there to be any gray area, or we at least want there to be as little gray area as possible if we find ourselves in a situation where a pretty serious decision has to be made, okay? I'm gonna presume that most people that are tuning in right now remember to some extent um, the Terry Schiavo situation, right? I think that I wanna say that was in the early 90s. Um, you know, I don't have all the facts in front of me right now, but you know, the gist of, the gist of it was that there, there was a battle. There was a battle between her husband and it was, and, and, and this was her husband, not, a, not, not for a very long time. I want to say it was a, that she was very young. They were not married that long, but the battle was between her husband and her parents. And her husband said, this is not how she'd want to live. We don't, there's no, re, we, I do not want her life to be prolonged. At the end of the day, after they had tried, and you know, they had tried some, some treatment for her and some therapies, um, and, and she was in and out of a coma. Her husband at, at one point got to the point of saying, listen, this is not what she want. And then her parents, as I would presume of any parents, and, and, and I, I wouldn't presume, I'm a, I'm a parent myself, so I know that it would be, I can't imagine how difficult it would be for parents to not try to do everything they could to keep their child alive, right? You know, it would make, it'll, it's gonna make me teary-eyed just even, even thinking about that with my own kids. And so I totally get it, but this is why it's so important for those around us to know how we feel. Because if they don't, then it becomes very difficult, right? Because then they're playing a guessing game as to what Matt would have wanted. And that's a pretty serious guessing game, right? We're basically playing Russian roulette to some extent at that point. And I can guarantee that none of us wanna be in that situation. None of us would wanna be in a situation where we had to make a decision for somebody and we didn't know what they wanted. And this is more so, and we'll get to this, this is more so than me just checking a box on a document and, and hoping that at some point, God forbid, a, tough, a difficult decision has to be made that, okay, well, you know what? My son or daughter or my, or my wife will know what to do because you know I checked this box. So again, I, I, won't, I won't go any deeper because uh, I'll start to talk in circles, but I, I really just want to make people aware of how important I think it is to have this conversation. And, and I don't think there's, 
and this isn't an age thing. This isn't like, oh man, I, I just turned 80. I should probably have this conversation with my, my, uh, my spouse and my kids. Um, you know, we all know that things can happen to us at any point in time. I don't, just because you're 80 doesn't mean you're, you're at any more risk of, of passing away the next day than somebody that's 25. Maybe a little bit greater, but for the most part, we know that things can happen, right? We know, we know that there are things that are out of our control that can, that can make things go sideways pretty quickly, right? I, I'm, I'm presuming that we've all either been touched by that in some sense, whether it's been a family member or a friend or a friend of a friend, we've heard stories where something happened out of the blue that somebody was not expecting. And um, so there's, there's no better time than the present to have these conversations, okay? There's my, uh, there's my monologue. Um, so let's, so let's talk about a few documents that I, that I think are very important, right? So I think a nice transition here would be talk, to talk about powers of attorney. And we'll start by talking about the healthcare power of attorney. Um, so just in general, in Illinois, we have two types of powers of attorney documents. We have healthcare and property. Um, healthcare is the power of attorney where I'm, I'm naming somebody to make medical decisions for me in the event that I cannot make my own decisions. In Illinois, I can name as many people as I want but I can only name them one at a time, okay? Uh, and I like this, all right? I think our neighbors in Indiana, I always say this, I should probably check my, do some research on this before I keep, well, because I keep on saying this, but I know as of a year ago or so, because uh, I've had clients come, you know, clients that moved here and they work with an attorney in Indiana, Indiana allows you to name two people. They allow, Indiana allows you to name co-agents on our power of attorney. So I could name my wife and my, brother as as co-agents to be making medical decisions for me together whereas in illinois yes i can name my wife and brother but my wife is going to be my primary agent and my brother will be the successor so if my wife cannot do it either due to death incapacity or she resigns then my brother steps in and i can name obviously backups to my brother right i can name as many people as i want i always tell clients to use a baseball reference i like having a deeper bench on a power of attorney. There's no harm in naming seven people if I only need one. Great, I had, a, I had six people as a backup plan, I never needed them. I'd rather have six backups and never need them than only have one backup and need a third, right? Or have no backups to the first person and need a second. Now, as I say that, I'm also not suggesting that we just name Joe the neighbor because he's a nice guy and he mows our lawn and we're out of town, right? I mean. We're not, we're not going to be pulling straws to name somebody on our power of attorney. You just heard me go into some detail about all of the, you know, the serious, de serious decisions that somebody might have to make. This should be somebody close to us, right? I mean, I, I would think that that's pretty, that's pretty uh, um, that we can all assume that, even though I know, you know, we all know what we say when we assume. But I think that is, that is a safe assumption, right? That somebody named on a healthcare power of attorney, we trust them. We trust that they are going to step in and make decisions for us in accordance with, with what we would have made for ourselves if we had the ability to make our own decision. So this is one of those things where, again, to go back to what I was saying in the beginning, we need to make sure that the people that we're naming know how we feel and that they're comfortable making those decisions for us if something that serious, if a decision that serious had to be made, okay? Because I might think that my daughter, because you know, my daughter is the sweetest person in the world. She's got a heart of gold. She wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't harm a fly. She'd be such a great power of attorney for healthcare. Yeah. Maybe not, right? Because if I don't want my life artificially prolonged, that daughter of mine might have a really hard time not prolonging my life. I mean, I hope she'd have a hard time not doing it anyway, but I would hope that she would honor my wishes, right? And that's what, that's what it comes down to. So it comes down to the fact that not just, you know, are they willing to make a decision, but are they willing to make a potentially very difficult decision? Um, clearly, I think my daughter can, can hear me talking and hear about her because she's standing outside the door yelling my name. Um, so again, we wanna make sure that we've got the right people named and that they're the right people because they're willing to not just step in to make a decision, but step in to make our decision. And that's so important here. We are, we are wanting somebody to step in and make our decision for us, not their decision. 
Okay, and that's very different, right? Because the person I'm aiming might feel differently. They might want their life prolonged to the greatest extent possible, and that's fine. But we want them to be able to then separate how they feel about what they want for themselves from what we want, from what I want for me. Okay. A healthcare power attorney in Illinois, just so everybody's aware, for it to be effective, I only need one witness. So I sign the document. I obviously need to be of sound mind. I cannot be incapacitated signing a, a, a healthcare power of attorney. And then I need one witness that's signing it, that's witnessing my signature. And that person has to be un, I hope this is this would be obvious, but that person cannot be one of the people that I'm naming in the document. And that witness can also not be related to me by blood or marriage. Okay, the person witnessing the document, just the witness, not the people that I'm naming. People that the, the person that is witnessing my signature cannot be related to me by blood, and mar blood or marriage. They cannot be named the document. And then it can also not be a medical professional that's currently treating me. Okay, so my doctor can't be my, my witness. The other power attorney we have in Illinois is the healthcare, is the uh, property power attorney. All right, the property power attorney is who can make decisions for me if I am unable to make my own with respect to everything that's not medical. So if I'm incapacitated, who can have, who can deal with social security on my behalf? Medicare, who can sign a Medicaid application for me? Who can file my tax returns? Who can have access to my checking accounts, savings accounts, IRAs, 401ks, life insurance policies, stocks, bonds, investments, deal with my house, my condo, sign a contract on my behalf. I know this is kind of morbid, but you know, in the spirit of uh, the month of, of October and Halloween, I always kind of think of this idea of uh, Anthony Hopkins in Silence of the Lambs, right? Who is gonna put on my face and become me? And that's really what your property power of attorney is. Sorry, for those of you that haven't seen it, then you're probably better off. Um, but you know, really, who who really who steps into who puts the Matt Margolis mask on and becomes me? And that is your property power of attorney. This person, you are giving this person clearly giving this person a lot of power. Okay. So, and it's a it's a different kind of power than the healthcare power of attorney, right? The healthcare power of attorney is. Is, is, a, is a power in the sense of, of making medical decisions, right? That's vastly different to me, in my opinion, than somebody that I'm, I'm naming that can step in and make financial decisions for me, okay? Now, again, I wanna make sure that I'm naming the right people. Similar to the healthcare power attorney, I can name as many people as I want, but it's one at a time in a particular order, okay? I can have three people named, I can have 10 people named, I can have one person named, um, again, same situation as a healthcare power of attorney. I'd like to have a deeper bench. Rather, if I've got three or four or five people I can name, great. However, again, we're not just going to grasp at straws. All right. If I've only got one or two people that I really trust, then that's all I'm going to name. Right. I'm not going to. I'm not going to stretch to name my niece or nephew that I haven't talked to in 20 years, or that I talk to, you know, once every three years, just because it's a it's a younger family member. And, you know, if my, if my husband or wife couldn't do it and my one child couldn't do it, then that's who I would name. Um, you know, there are, and just to go back to the healthcare power attorney, there are professionals and there are companies that we can name at, to act as power of attorney. And so for some clients of mine, I mean, there are clients of mine that I meet that don't have anybody. They're not, they're not married or their, their spouse might be incapacitated. Their spouse might have some form of dementia where they definitely can't name their spouse to make decisions for them. They don't have children or they don't have children that they can rely on. They're not close with any of their nieces or nephews. Their peers are all of a similar age. And if these are called my clients in their eighties, you know, the idea of naming their friends who are in their eighties as their power of attorney might not be the, you know, might be okay if we name them, but we probably still want a, a backup, right? In that case, we definitely want some kind of a backup. And so I just want to throw it out there. I'm not going to go into any detail on it, but there are companies out there and there are certain professionals, certain individuals that, that will sort of act as a healthcare or property power of attorney for hire. 
Okay, so those do exist, and there is a need for them. Um, so I just want to just want to make sure that people are aware of that. Um, the property power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney. You know, again, we want to make sure we're naming the right person. Healthcare, we talked about. You know, figuring out the right person there for property. You know, I always have clients that have this idea of, oh, you know, my my daughter's a lawyer, or my son's a financial advisor, or my my, my, my other son's a CPA. Like that's that's who I should name as my power of attorney for property because it's for all the financial things. And my response to my clients is, yeah, but you are none of those things. You're not a lawyer. You're not a CPA. You're not a financial advisor. But somehow you've managed to make it 80 years handling all of those things for yourself. Why do you think that the person that has to take over for you needs to fit into one of those categories? That person doesn't, okay? That person does not need to be in one of those categories. And actually, maybe your, your daughter, the lawyer, or your son, the CPA, might actually be a terrible person to name because they work crazy hours. And when they're not working, they're taking care of their family. And so the idea of them having to step and step into your life and handle all of your stuff on top of their own, that may not be the best option. My thought for a property power of attorney, you know, what I tell clients all the time is who's good at managing a household? That's a good power of attorney for property. Who's good at making sure that bills get paid on time? Taxes are filed when they should be. Something breaks down in the house, they're getting it fixed. Somebody that's good at staying on top of things is a good power of attorney. Here's the reality, right? I'm just thinking of myself here, and I'm sure many of you fall into the same category, right? We might be working with a banker or a financial advisor to manage our assets. We might be high, we might work with a CPA or, or an accountant or a tax preparer of some sort to do our taxes. And then we hire professionals to take care of all the things that break down in our house because I'm just going to presume most of us are probably not fixing the sink when it breaks or the toilet when it breaks or the HVAC unit. And so I don't need somebody to step in that knows how to do those things themselves. I just need somebody to step in that's going to be savvy enough to say, oh yeah, you know, I know that Matt has the CPA that he was working with. I'll call his CPA to do his taxes. Oh yeah, you know, Matt's, Matt's uh, bank accounts are at BMO Harris or Merrill Lynch. Yeah, and he works with his financial advisor. I'll go to that person and just make sure that everything's under control. I mean, that's really what we need from a power of attorney. So I don't wanna beat a dead horse, but I really want people to understand that it, that power of attorney is, is just needs to be resourceful. They just need to know that they're gonna step into my shoes and just work with all the same people that I was already working with. They don't need to be able to figure those things out themselves, okay? A healthcare power of attorney or a property power of attorney can take effect in one of two ways. They can take effect immediately. So the day I sign the document, it can be effective. Or I can sign it in a way where it only takes effect upon a doctor putting something in writing, saying that I can no longer make my own decisions with respect to either healthcare or financial. There's no right or wrong. You know, I'd say the majority of my clients um, married or not, typically have the healthcare power of attorney take effect only upon a doctor putting something in writing saying that they're incapacitated. And I think that's because most of us kind of can't can't picture a situation where as long as I can, as long as we can make our own medical decisions, why would we have somebody else step in to start making them for us? What I typically tell clients is, you know, the benefit that I see in the healthcare power of attorney being effective immediately, it's not because my wife's going to make a decision for me as long as I can make my own. And by the way, my decision, as long as I have capacity, will trump any decision she tries to make for me, okay? Um, it's not like I always make the joke. It's not like my wife's going to go to the doctor and have them tell them that, you know, they should amputate my right arm. And somehow I'm just going to go in for surgery and, uh, you know, kicking and screaming, and they're going to do it because she's my power of attorney. The reason I like the power of attorney to become effective immediately, and I'd say this, I'd say this, to me, this is probably more so for in two different categories, which is a lot of people that I meet with, but not everybody, would be a, a married couple or an older individual that you know, might be naming their spouse or, or minor children, um, or not minor children, their adult children, sorry. And that's because, you know, listen, it, it might get to a point where, you know, uh, my capacity is sort of a little gray, right? And maybe I'm okay in some cases making decisions, but I'm not okay in others. 
not a bad idea for that to become effective immediately because that way my, my wife can communicate with my doctor and talk about things and maybe, you know, make certain decisions for me that, you know, where, where I maybe, maybe I'm not making the most appropriate decision. And it would give the doctor the ability to, to talk to, to my spouse about it or my adult child about it and go through that with them. Um, everybody, listen, everybody has their own preference and their own, their own comfortability factor with what works for them at the end of the day. All right. For the property power of attorney, um, I will say that the vast majority of clients we meet with have an effective sort of opposite from healthcare. The vast majority will have it effective immediately. And I don't know if that's to people's surprise here or not. Um, but the idea behind that is, you know, so, so the day I signed my health, my property power of attorney, right. Eight years ago, whenever I signed it, my wife, um, I don't even think we were married at the time, actually. Uh, so I already trusted her quite a bit. Um, but I, I signed my property power of attorney where, where my now wife could basically step in and make decisions for me. Meaning she could have access, she could access my IRAs, my 401ks, my bank accounts without me knowing. The idea behind naming a property power of attorney and whether it's the first person you're naming or the fifth person you're naming is should first and foremost be that I'm naming somebody or you're naming somebody or we're naming people that we trust. And, and what I always tell clients, because inevitably there's clients that I sit down with and I say, do you want this to be effective immediately or only upon a doctor putting something in writing? And, you know, 10% of the time, my client will be like, oh, like no way would I want it to be effective. And like right now, gosh, like no way. Now that that then has, has, has you know, my ears kind of go up. And my thought is, well, okay, now I'm uncomfortable with you naming the person that you're naming. Because why would you be more comfortable with this person stepping in and having access to your all of your financials if you were incapacitated and presumably couldn't really, wouldn't really be aware if they were doing something that was not in your best interests? So you're comfortable with that, but you're not comfortable with the idea of them having access now where, you know, God forbid, they did something that they shouldn't do, you would at least be able to be aware of it, right? presuming you, you look at your bank statements. So I hope that made sense, everybody. You know, and so the idea with the power of attorney becoming effective immediately, again, number one is that we trust all the people we're naming. And if there's any issues with any kind of trust, then, that's, then that person's not the right person to name. And I don't care if it's the first person or the fifth person, that person should not be named on the document. If we have any thoughts that that person might do something that we would not want them to do, then they are not appropriate to be named on there. Presuming that everybody that we've named is very upstanding and trustworthy, and we know that they would only act in our best interest, I like it to take effect immediately because you know what? Probably not as common for, for younger clients to maybe need a spouse to step in, but it could be, right? What if what if a, a husband or wife is traveling and there's just, I know this is crazy, it might sound crazy, but you know, something has to be done. Maybe they're gonna be signing a mortgage or something needs to be signed. Something needs to be taken care of. Well, the spouses can sign for each other. Okay, legally, they can sign each other, sign for each other. I'd say this is probably more relevant to older individuals I work with because I've got some older clients that are still have full capacity to make their own decisions. It's not as if they can't. It's not as if a doctor has said they're incapacitated or that, that they, they can't do things for themselves anymore. But there's just clients I have that are certain things they don't want to deal with anymore. They don't, they don't want to deal with filing their tax return and sitting down with their CPA. They might not want to sit down with their financial advisor for their annual review. They might not be interested in dealing with paying their own bills anymore. And so if the power of attorney is effective immediately, then it would allow that agent who they're naming, that adult child or whoever they're appointed to handle all these things on their behalf, right? And they can legally do it. Um, again, it all comes down to trust. Okay. If we trust the person, there should be no problem, whether it's effective immediately or not effective immediately. Now I want to talk about um, the post. Okay, so well, before I get to the post, there's there's a document called a living will. Now I think people can use this, you know, because people all the time reach out to me and say, "Hey Matt, you know, I, I, I need I think I need a living will," and they say living will, but really what they mean is that they they want a last will and testament, right? And that's the document where we're deciding who gets all of our stuff when we pass away, right? And who and, and where does everything go? 
or the, you know, or they or they mean a living trust. And a, and a trust is very similar to a will, except it works a little differently. It avoids probate. Um, but a living will is is a it can be, it's typically a one to three page document that is only appropriate for those of us that do not want our lives artificially prolonged. So the living will is a document that I'm only going to sign if I do not want my life artificially prolonged. And it, and it goes into a little more detail than the healthcare power of attorney. The one thing I did not mention with the healthcare power of attorney, I don't know how I forgot this, is that there are two options on the healthcare power of attorney as to how I feel about end of life care. And I can check the box that says, do whatever you can to keep me alive, no matter how bad I am, no matter how terrible things are, no matter if I have zero quality of life, keep me alive to keep me alive. Or the other option is the quality of life option. Right? I value the quality of my life over the quantity. Do what you can to keep me alive, but if things don't look good, don't just leave, don't just string me along. All right. And so we get to check one of those boxes on the healthcare power of attorney. And again, alluding to what I said in the beginning of our conversation today, I don't really care what box my clients check. I want to make sure that they're having a conversation with the people that they're naming so that those people can hear it from their mouth as to how they feel. So the living will sort of expands on that uh, idea of I value the quality of my life over the quantity. And it talks about, you know, don't just give me, um, you know, I don't want to be given all these extra drugs to keep me alive. I don't want to be hooked up onto a ventilator if that's the only way that I can live the rest of my life. Um, I don't want a feeding tube. I don't want any kind of extraneous treatments. Um, the living will is really just more proof, more evidence to our power of attorney for our healthcare, that we don't want our life artificially prolonged, okay? Um, but the living will is not a controlling document. And what I mean by that is if the paramedics were to come to my house and I had no pulse and I was not breathing and my living will just happened to be laying on my chest when they arrived, the paramedics would rip it off my chest and bring me back to life because that living will is not direction to them to not try to save my life. It is direction to my healthcare power of attorney. It is not going to prevent a medical professional from not trying to save my life. Because just so everybody knows, that is the default. The default of all healthcare providers is to bring, to do whatever they can to bring somebody back to life or to resuscitate somebody. And so we, for them not to do that, the document, then for them not to do that, it's going to be basically one of two things. Either my healthcare power of attorney is going to be able to be contacted soon enough and, pres or, and or present to say, listen, Matt doesn't want any of that treatment. Okay, that's not what he wanted. Don't do that. Or we're going to be relying on a document called a post. P. O-L-S-T. It stands for Practitioner's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if I can... Pam, I normally don't share my screen, but if I, I don't know if I, if I can share my screen. I don't know if I need your permission. I'm just going to try to do it. You can. You can go ahead and do that. Can you guys see that? Um, you might have to put it in there. Yep. You guys can see it? Yep. Okay. All right. So here's a POLST. All right. And, and, and POLST stands for Practitioner's Order for Life Sustaining Treatment. I, I imagine most of you are probably familiar to some extent with a DNR. You've probably heard about, heard of a DNR at some point, the do not resuscitate. Okay. So, and you see that, you see that on the top of this form, on the top right corner, it says, do not resuscitate, DNR, slash, practitioner orders for life-sustaining treatment, post form. So for the longest time in Illinois, all we had was a DNR, a do not resuscitate. And that was, and the only thing, the only time that we would sign a DNR is if, if, if our decision was, you know what, if I have no pulse and I'm not breathing, I do not want to be resuscitated, right? Do not attempt resuscitation. So then I would sign a DNR. And if I wanted to be resuscitated, I wouldn't sign one. It was that simple. I'm forgetting when the pulse was introduced to Illinois at this point. 
I keep on saying, I want to say it was about 2013 or so. Um, but at some point, and, and, and this really started in the, in the Northwest, I want to say it was in, in Washington or, or Oregon, um, where they're a little more progressive um, from a medical standpoint, uh, at least an end of life, end of life standpoint. There became this idea that we need more, right? In the event that a healthcare power of attorney is unavailable to make a decision or, 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 or somebody just doesn't have a healthcare power of attorney because there's nobody in their life that they really can rely on, we want a document that, that speaks to more than just resuscitation, okay? And so we have this, this POLST form now. Um, and this POLST, you know, talks about, so you look at section A, it talks about, do I wanna be resuscitated or not? So again, the DNR, we would have only, you would have only signed the DNR if you did not want to be resuscitated. It's not as if you would sign it and there was an option that where you could be very clear saying, I do want you to attempt resuscitation, okay? So in this form, we can actually say yes or no to, res to resuscitation, all right? Then, we, then there's in section B, we talk about different medical interventions. I'm not going to go into tons of detail here. Uh, if anybody's interested in this, you can you can email you can email me, you can email Pam. I'll put my email in the in the chat box, um, and I'm happy to send you the form. But we can make decisions as to how what type of treatment we want, if in the event that we that we you know, and in the situation where we can't make our own, we can't voice our own decisions, right? And so you can look at this and, and we can say, you know what, I want full treatment, right? And the primary goal is sustaining life by medically indicated means, right, as it says. Or, you know what, selective treatment, right? And so I want not, I don't want to just be kept comfortable, but, you know, I want IV fluids, medications, maybe antibiotics, um, but I still don't want to be intubated, you know, some kind of less, less uh, invasive uh, uh, airway support, okay? Or, you know what, I just want comfort-focused treatment, all right? Relieve my pain through suffering, uh, relieve my pain and suffering through, you know, use of medication, um, oxygen, et cetera. So I can be selective here as to sort of what type of treatment I want, right? And, I, and the way I kind of describe it is full throttle, do whatever you can to keep me alive, just enough to keep me comfortable or somewhere in between. And the last thing in section C is, do I want artificial feeding? Okay. Um, do I want feeding tubes for a long-term period? Maybe I just want, you know, maybe, I, hey, I don't want, if, if, if a feeding tube is what I need for the rest of my life, maybe I don't want that. But maybe for a trial period, right? Maybe, you know what, I'm having a surgery, you know, they're saying that I might just need a feeding tube for a couple of weeks. Okay, maybe I'm okay with that. Or I say, you know what, I don't, I don't want any artificial feeding. I don't want a feeding tube. I don't want any kind of artificial nutrition. I don't want any of that. Okay, and so I get to choose how I feel there. As far as who can sign a pulse, okay, I can sign it myself. So if it's my pulse, I can sign it, or my healthcare power of attorney can sign it on my behalf. Okay. Now a pulse. It's a, it's a legally enforceable form, but it is not a, this is not a legal document in the sense of this is not a document that we prepare for our clients. It's not a document that any attorney prepares for their clients. This form I'm showing you, this is the statutory form. It's prepared by, by Illinois statute. Um, Illinois Department of Health. This is what this is, they prepare it, okay? Um, and so that's why I say, if, you, if, you are, if you're interested in a copy, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, when we sign this, it needs to be signed by us or our power of attorney for healthcare. We need to have a witness. And then it needs to be signed by a, a, a one medical, a certain medical provider. So to go back for a second, when this came out initially, 2000, again, 2012 or 13, it was called, um, what was it called? It was the P was not practitioner. The P stood for physician. And so this had to be signed by somebody's attending physician. But as time went on, and as it became more difficult you know, to schedule a meeting with somebody's doctor just to go over this form, 
rather than you know going in for a, a checkup or you know some we could do to some sort of ailment, Illinois said, you know what, we should probably expand the medical professionals that can sign this because doctor, you know, the doctor's time is, is, is becoming more and more difficult, right? We all know that doctors don't even doctors rarely visit their patients in the hospitals anymore, right? You, you're seen by if you're in the hospital, you're seen by a hospitalist. Um, and so you'll see that in, in section E here, signature of attending practitioner, it can be signed by your physician, a resident, second year or higher, an advanced practice nurse, an APN, or a physician's assistant. Okay, so there are four different medical providers that can sign this. Okay, listen, this is, this is a good form to have if it's appropriate for you. And I'm going to tell you that right now that I've got clients that are in their 60s and 70s that say, Matt, you know what? I feel like I should have a pulse. I should sign one. And I tell them, you know what? Feel free to go to your doctor. But I can tell you, your most doctors, most medical professionals who have to sign off on this are typically pretty uncomfortable signing it for somebody who is younger. And, and 70s or 80s could be younger in the physician's mind. Um, somebody that's younger and that does not have a terminal illness. And the, the idea behind that is most people, now it's going to be dependent on how that person feels. Okay. I think a big aspect in a lot of cases is if that person does not want to be resuscitated. A lot of medical professionals are going to be unwilling to sign it for somebody that's younger and that doesn't have a terminally ill condition. Here's the reason why. And there are more reasons than this, but this is, this is the one reason that I was talking to a doctor. And it was the example that she gave me. And she said, Matt, what most people don't realize is that if they have a heart attack, they might not have a pulse. In a lot of cases, they will not have a pulse and they might not be breathing. But most of us would want to be resuscitated from a heart attack. And so if, what people don't realize is they sign a pulse or a DNR. And it says they do not want to be resuscitated and they had a heart attack. We will not, the paramedics will not for, try to bring them back to life. And for somebody in their 50s or 60s or 70s that has a heart attack, most of the time they're probably going to want to be resuscitated from that. I think the difference is most people sort of think of this, they don't think of a situation like that. They're thinking of a situation where they're like in a coma, right? They're, they're, they're thinking of that sort of situation, they're not thinking of some of these other situations where they might, not, they might not be breathing, they might not have a pulse. And so again, most physicians, most physicians, physician's assistants, advanced practice nurses, residents, again, might be uncomfortable signing for somebody who's younger or, or somebody that does not have a terminal illness for those reasons, okay? I'm not saying, I mean, if this is something that you're, that somebody is interested in signing, I'm not saying that they shouldn't try to discuss it with their doctor. I'm not saying that this is true of every doctor. This has been brought to my attention. I've had a few clients, younger, 70s, gone to their doctors. They'll come back to me saying, my doctor won't sign off on the pulse. So, um, but again, if, if, if this is somebody, something that, that you know, anybody is really keen on signing, you know, I, again, feel free. I'm happy to send you a copy via email. Go to your, go to your doctor, you know, call your doctor's office, see if it's, uh, if it, how, you know, how, how they go about potentially uh, you know, sitting down and signing it with you. Um, the last thing I'm gonna comment on is that, you know, so the Pulse took over from the DNR, right? Before the Pulse came into effect, and it's still referred to as the DNR slash Pulse, but before it became the Pulse in, like I said, 2012 or 2013, you know, people just signed DNRs. And so people always ask me, you know, if I have a DNR from that I signed in 2000 or 1995, is it still, good? Is it still effective? The answer is yes, right? Anytime we've signed a document, even though it's maybe been replaced by something newer or the statutes have changed, and that's similar with, you know, there's clients that come in with old powers of attorney documents that they put in place in the 90s. They're still good. The question is, is it the right document now? Probably not, right? Because there's been enough changes to a lot of these documents in the last 20 to 30 years, depending on when some people have signed them, where it might make sense to update that, might make sense to sign new ones, but does it mean that the old ones are not good? No, as long as they were put in place appropriately, meaning they were, they were signed, they were witnessed, they were notarized, whatever the requirements were, as long as they were done appropriately, then they're still good. 
right? They're kind of grandfathered in, if you will. As I'm saying that, the one thing I forgot to say about the property power attorney, I'm good at forgetting things if you haven't realized that. Um, that's what happens when you don't use a script. Um, the one thing with the property power attorney I forgot to mention is the signing requirements. Okay, so we talked about the healthcare power attorney, you need one witness. The property power attorney, you need a witness and a notary. Well, it's 10.03. Uh, that, that's all I've got for everybody, but I'm happy to entertain any questions if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask. And I'll also put my email in the chat box just so everybody has it in case you want to send me an email if you have any questions. And I can also forward his email to anyone as well. I learned a lot. I learned I have a lot of paperwork to get started on. <laughs> well, thank you, Matt. Yeah, most people. You're welcome. <laughs> hey, Pam, you mentioned that um, like the recording could be available through like a, a YMC podcast. Is there a link you can share for that? Or maybe is it just on the North Suburban YMC website? It is. And then if you go under the YES programs where you like register and stuff, there's another tab that says, um, see, actually, I can pull it up and show you real quick. Thanks. Um, oh, you know what? I've been doing website stuff, so it's not going to let me pull that up. Um, it is. Let me just type it right here. Yeah, if you just go to our main website and then that box that says YES in there, you just click that or just go to YES. And then um, it'll be, it's one of the boxes um, that says uh, podcasts. Okay, super. Thank you so much. Of course, yes. I'll send it, I can send it out to the group too. Uh, Matt, one question. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, power of attorney, my wife and I, at power of attorney and uh, a regular will, not a living will, a regular will, all, all made up in Maryland about five years ago. Now, presumably, there could be lots of things that Illinois doesn't like about these. That's a question. Uh, so is it the sort of thing that is appropriate for you to review and say, you know, this is this is not going to work in Illinois or whatever. Yeah, that's a good question, Henry. Hank, I think you go by Hank. Okay. Um, so, great question. You know, we typically recommend that people, if they've got documents that they put in place in other states, and then they've moved now, they've moved to Illinois, and Illinois will be there. You know, it's now going to be their their primary residence. It's a good idea to have an attorney review review the documents. You know, we might you know a lot of times we might look at trusts and wills, and those documents might be fine. Right. There may not be a whole lot of changes that, that we need to make with those. It's still a good idea to review them just in case. Um, but one thing, what documents that we do typically um, suggest that people uh, update when they move to Illinois is powers of attorney. Um, you know, those are very state specific. And while they're still good, you know, my two cents to clients is, you know, the really, now that you're living here, you're going to be going to bank. You know, you're going to be using probably going to financial institutions that are in Illinois. You might have to be applying for benefits at some point that are Illinois based. Um, you are going to be using Illinois medical services. And so when it comes down to it, it's just gonna be easier if you've got Illinois documents because all these places that you're gonna be going to are gonna be more familiar with them. And it's just gonna make life a little bit easier. So um, those are documents that we tend to update. Whereas again, the wills and the trusts Sometimes we, you know, there are updates that, that make sense. Um, sometimes it's, it's tax laws in different states where we might need to make adjustments for that reason, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, if there's no other questions, uh, we did put, uh, Matt did put his contact information in the chat box. Um, we'll close out. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, uh, that concludes our YMC education series presentation. Again, Matt, I learned so much um, and thank you for that. On behalf of the North Suburban YMCA and the YES program, we thank you for supporting our organization and programs like, like this. Special thank you to Matt Margolis today for speaking with us.
programs like this are free and open to everyone in the community. So if you enjoyed today's program, please come and support our YMCA with a donation at nsymca.org or just check out all of our podcasts. Um, we'd like to see you at our next speaker series event, which is tomorrow. And it is on COVID and college admissions at 11 a.m. with, with Way. So awesome. And have everyone a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, Bye. Pam. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day, all. You too.